Seniors' health care in the home is a major theme in New Brunswick. We have systemic challenges to how we look after our aging population. Today's guest is Karen Lake. She is a senior home care specialist and care navigator. Her conversation takes us into many of the details about how to provide home health care, the systemic change that's needed that could also create many jobs, and the notion of using a snow globe as an image for how we need to turn the system upside down and turn it back up and watch the new pieces fall into place. So welcome to the show. Thank you. As we were warming up, you were talking about your many personalities, and one of them is being an activist. <laughs> um, so the field of home health care and all of the buzz currently in the media about mm -hmm. Meta V Blue Cross taking over administration of extramural and and then all of the many New Brunswickers who are looking for the system to kick in and to help them. And you mm -hmm. sit at the intersection of all those parts. And a key piece of that is the activism, helping people understand and promoting what to do and when to do it. Yeah, yeah the activism part um, can, I guess it does touch a few different roles. The, the, the biggest um, issue um, in regards to the extramural and, and meta V um, uh, issue that you just spoke about um, is really just helping people to even decide or determine the differences between what is home health care and what is in home care. Um, it, it has raised a lot of issues and it has people scratching their head and asking a lot of questions. Uh, so I did take the opportunity to write a blog about that specifically because it seemed timely that at the time when people were asking a lot of questions about what's the difference between home health care, like what extramural provides, and what's in-home care or home support care. So there is a big difference between the two of them, um, being that ho home health care is administered by a professional, uh, could be a nurse, a dietitian, a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, and it's typically paid for by government services, by the Department of Health. Whereas in-home support is usually provided by an unregulated care force of personal care workers, home support workers, um, that particular skill set. Hmm. So there is a difference between the two. Um, but it has been timely because the whole issue with home health care and in-home health, um, supporting people at home has been a really hot topic lately. Um, so that's been great for uh, the effort of getting home in home support services on the map and getting some attention because it really needs some attention <laughs> yeah yeah what inspired you to go out on your own did you did you see a huge need of some sort uh, i've been working in home health care for i always gauge it by how old my son is i'm gonna so i'm gonna say 21 <laughs> years about 21 22 years i started uh, in home health care and i just really always um enjoyed uh, seeing people being supported at home mm. and seeing some of their health needs being able to be met at home. I really enjoyed the family dynamic. I liked being involved with the family, seeing the client as a whole and helping people to recover at home. That really appealed to me. And so once um, I entered into that field, I really didn't go back to um, in hospital care or another uh, way of nursing. This was just uh, my niche, as we call it in nursing. And I had found it and I really enjoyed it. Um, did I see a need? There's a huge need uh, for people to have uh, support and guidance, to have their questions answered. Um, I didn't know that this was coming for me. I had been working at a previous post for several years and um, things changed at that post. Um, but I realize now that it was a gift and um, now I get to do uh, different things and help more people. Uh, in a much broader way. So I'm still doing what I've always loved, just in, <coughs> um, in a very unique way. Yeah. Mm. Great. Yeah. Back to the activist part then. Mm. Um, so it sounds like you're at this major intersection. Also, you're probably in the right spot at the right time because it's such a large public conversation about home health care, reducing uh, hospital costs, and people mm -hmm. wanting to stay in their home longer. Mm -hmm. um, once upon a time, our extramural system was set up in the late 80s and early 90s for that sole purpose. Um, 
I'm still not clear if it's the world class model it once was, or if politics and budgets have chipped away at, at the delivery of that service. I do know on the other side that people are trying to make their way through a complex system that has, has its own private language. Hmm. So in the activist work that you do, what's the top uh, item or the top two or three items that um, should be shared with a bigger audience? Mm -hmm. There's no doubt the extramural program is an excellent program. Um, I don't I don't know that I necessarily agree with it having to be outsourced. I think we have a solid civil service that probably could have managed some of those issues um, and, and solved some of the, the problems. I don't know that it necessarily had to be outsourced um, to, make, to uh, obtain efficiencies, mm. um, but it is a good system. I think that any large bureaucratic system like that does need review and does need to look for cost savings. Um, and probably there could be efficiencies found there. Mm -hmm. Where I feel that there could be more benefit um, from outsourcing and integrating with Ambulance New Brunswick would have been looking at the other end of the spectrum and looking at these in-home support caregivers um, who are grossly underfunded in our province and have been for many years and enhancing that sector so that so that was a, a well organized more efficient more regulated system that would encourage more people to enter to become a caregiver i, I truly believe if we had more in-home personal support workers mm -hmm. there could be a lot more people supported at home i think a lot of people end up going to hospital because their caregiver if they're fortunate enough to have someone yeah has become burned out or has become tired and has just raised their hands in in their fatigue they're in burnout mm -hmm. and they really just can't handle the responsibility any longer and I, I really do believe that a lot more people could be supported in the community if they had in-home help mm -hmm. so that's the other part of the activist work so the in-home help can you paint us some specifics to that for example, is mm -hmm. it are they paid minimum wage or is it a little bit more than that? Mm -hmm. Is there a high turnover rate in that position mm -hmm. because the pay is so low? Mm -hmm. um, what are the training opportunities in order to get into that field? Mm -hmm. There are training organizations in the province and they typically train personal care workers. Um, there's a tuition, they use a standardized curriculum and it, it is more costly. You are in class for the entire duration of your course and you do your curriculum and then you find a job. But the way that the service providers or the agencies, if you will, that employ home support workers and personal support workers in the province, they have had to adapt a train as you go method or they have to train their own staff so in order for them to even have enough staff to fulfill your request when you call to ask for help for your family member they have to train their own people and so they're always constantly recruiting hmm. training and putting them out to work while they're training and I really don't think that's a very efficient system. I mean, personally, if I was to hire someone to look after my parent, I would want them to have the training and the experience, not be a personal support worker in training. In process. Um, so that's a, that's a really big challenge that the service providers or the agencies, if you will, um, who provide these services face is because they have to train their own and they are, they're having to absorb that cost. Um, the program's grossly underfunded and the staff are paid a little bit more than, min than minimum wage, as you had said. Mm -hmm. um, the rate is typically around the 1340 per hour mark. Uh, some have benefits, some do not. Some pay mileage, some do not. They have to contribute to the cost of their training. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not a, a very well organized system. And therefore, you just don't have the appeal of, and people are not um, encouraged to go into that type of system yeah. because the pay is really not um, compensating them for the great responsibility that they have. One of the narratives in the province that's a constant is what do we do to help keep our young people here? Mm. And you're mapping out one avenue for those that have an affinity or a heart for that type of work, that if that system was a little more 
thoughtful or a little yeah. more mature as a system. Yeah. That would be one of the avenues to keeping more young people here. Because... There's a huge job creation. <laughs> There's a huge job creation strategy uh, or opportunity, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does take, um, as I say, uh, inverting it upside down and then setting it back up almost like a snow globe. <laughs> <laughs> like you have to invert it, shake it up and then put it back and... Yeah, and then reorganize things. Things really do need to be reorganized in the province if we do want to have people at home. Um, That's all the buzz. That's all we hear. It is truly the desire of most people as well. Most people would want to be supported in their community. Um, But it's really unfortunate that there's many people who cannot be. Um, And a big part of that is because there simply aren't enough formal care providers to provide to provide support and services to the people in the community as well as their families mm-hmm. and that's where it really does tie into my work because I do see many family caregivers family members who are trying to support their loved one going without care and they're doing it on their own because they either have tried to hire help have not been pleased with the caliber of the help they're they're getting because going back to the training issue, <laughs> yeah. um, and there's a lack of uh, qualified caregivers. There's a critical shortage in the province, and that's been well uh, voiced by many of the different organizations that look to represent uh, personal care worker issues. And so caregivers are going without. And when you don't have support, when you're providing care to a loved one, it can easily lead to burnout. And mm. you're the first one to hop in the car and say, I can't do this anymore and go to the hospital. And there someone will stay in mm. the hospital until such time they go to a nursing home. Yep. And that's a clear description of the systemic challenge that we have on healthcare. It's a challenge. And, and a lot of times the conversation around that challenge tends to be project mindset. Oh, if we just go and fix this part, then everything will be better rather than the systemic wall, because you want it to take the snow globe, shake it up, turn it upside down, because that's what it's going to take. Um, yeah, it means being bold. Yes. And it means being creative. <laughs> and it means being different. And those sometimes are things that don't always sit well um, in government and in policy. Um, it, it doesn't sit well. People don't, people generally resist change. Mm. But the whole, that old adage of um, it's how we've always done it, is not going to cut it Hmm. with the number of people that are entering the care system daily. And this isn't a new problem. Like I said, when we sat down, (laughs) um, I've been involved in the home care sector in Fredericton for at least 18 years. Hmm. And this goes way back to a point where we were having issues with finding enough qualified staff to care for people. So it's a long-standing problem, and it's one that won't be fixed overnight. It isn't just a matter of inverting and, yeah. and putting it back down. It is a lot of work to put the pieces together. And, and I, I can see some synergies with the extramural program. Uh, certainly, um, there have been some people who have gone so far as to say, um, could this whole sector not be a part of the extramural system? That would mean moving departments. Um, you know, there's 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 lots of different conversations going on about how this um, piece of supporting people at home with these caregivers it really is um, almost like another service, another uh, sector, if you will, hmm. that really um, is in synergy with the extramural services. They're they're paraprofessionals. They're uh, they're an unregulated professional, per, uh, personal support workers. They're generally unregulated in the province. Hmm. Um, but there's some synergies there with the work they do. Um, I can certainly see the synergy with personal care workers supporting uh, the same clients that extramural are seeing more so than an ambulance New Brunswick driver or an, an ambulance New Brunswick um, paramedic. Yep. I, I see the synergies a lot more with, with that than than integrating with ambulance New Brunswick. But. Hmm. So there's gaps that could be fixed. Another narrative in the province is in those gaps, we're a small place. Mm. We're supposed to be able to adapt quicker, move lighter, um, be a bit more creative because our scale is so small. In the healthcare delivery model, as you see it, 
even though you described it as it's going to be a challenge to take the bureaucracy, you sort of invert it a little bit. Mac. Do you see ways how that could happen? It gets into the how a little bit more than the what. But mm. but if, if we're at that crossroads, I think, in general, whether it's the economy, healthcare delivery, education, there's systemic challenges that need to find a new path to how to create the new solutions. So it'll take people like you in your field and others in their field to come up with Here's the concrete things we now need to start to change, which can then get into, okay, we need to let go <laughs> the old way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. A for instance would be mm -hmm. uh, the culture in New Brunswick since the mid-60s, um, every community is supposed to have a hospital. And yet the interview with John McGarry a year and a half ago when he was CEO of Horizon Health was that New Brunswick's perfectly geographically situated for a regional healthcare delivery model. Mm -hmm. But his main obstacle was the cultural narrative that every community needed physical bricks and mortar hospitals. Mm -hmm. So the breakthrough wasn't technology, the breakthrough wasn't budget, the breakthrough wasn't human resources, the breakthrough was a perception. Mm -hmm. We needed to shift that. Mm -hmm. I think may, in, in relation to some of the work that, that interests me and that I advocate for would be um, shifting in how we see personal care workers and seeing them as part of the continuum of health, that um, the continuum of health, if you will, starts at home and with the people and the, the um, professions that support them there. So. If, if, if things were to be restructured or shifted or changed, I think it would be our perception of, of that continuum of care. I know some people don't like to use that reference of continuum of care, but there, there generally is a point where people start to need help or support, and it's at home. Um, and seeing those services that people receive at home not as custodial work, but seeing it as that that's improving and supporting my health at home so that not dismissing the importance of having a nutritious meal, having your medications on time, having a clean home, a safe surrounding. That's all very conducive to your health. So rather than seeing these personal support services as custodial or a maid service, that these um, very important people are actually a part of supporting people's continuum of health and it all starts at home. So I think that's the biggest shift we need to make in the province is seeing this work as somewhat less important or seeing it as um, custodial is the word that keeps coming to me but um, that it's actually a part of it and that it's a really uh, integral part of it um, those examples, the, the medications, the meals, the clean environment, having a bath, having someone look at your skin, having someone support you walk, having someone make sure that you're safely moving around your home and not falling. Those are all huge things that can help prevent that burden um, at the hospital's doors. So if I really believe if there was an enhanced system of personal support, personal care worker support in the community, then many more people could be supported safely at home. Yeah, it, it starts with a shift in who these people are and how important their work really is. Yes. There are other professions that probably would echo the same sentiment. I'm yeah. thinking of uh, you know, people that work in daycares mm -hmm. and the conversation around daycares in the 80s and the 90s and finally getting the ECE or Early Childhood yes. Education Certification process and getting past paying minimum wage mm -hmm. because these are children you're caring for. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the, it echoes, it the, resonates. The Coalition for Pay Equity in the province have been working tirelessly on that very exact same issue. They've been working on the education uh, issue for sure. And alongside of that, they're working on the women that are in caring professions as well, specifically mm -hmm. personal support workers. Mm -hmm. And they're, they've got a campaign going right now. There, there's a lot of momentum right now. Um, this MetaV issue has raised the issue of home care. Um, there have been other people, other advocates, activists, uh, uh, public personas who have been speaking about the importance of in-home care and personal support care. Um, so the momentum is there right now. I think this is a, a moment to be heard right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're all, um, you know, speaking from the same songbook finally mm. um, but it is a matter of decision making and priority making and 
yeah, there's been some great people leading the, the issue. Um, we're in early January of 2018. 2018 is an election year. Um, do you think this can become a major theme through the election? And do you think that makes any difference? <laughs> We've had all kinds of political conversations over the past 20 years about how to make the system better, but we're mm -hmm. still having this conversation we're having today. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're at a tipping point and would an election be part of that tipping point or would it be just another version of political party offering promises and then they go do what they do two years from now anyway? Mm -hmm. I hope it's a tipping point. I think it's a matter of making care, making senior care a priority. Mm -hmm. um, as you had said earlier about in New Brunswick having this unique opportunity because we're small and being creative, we can try new things. Um, they sometimes refer to New Brunswick being, you know, the, the, the not the fishbowl, but um, the, a, a lab, a living lab. Uh, yeah. That's what it is, a living lab um, where we can try some unique, bold, creative things that will, will change. Um, but that that's, that's challenging and, and it, it will take a politician or a political party who wants to be bold and creative. Um, but one that um, really can't help but ignore the uh, gray wave, as some people refer to it, mm -hmm. um, because it's here and it's now and it's been here and now for a while. Yep. And it really would be amiss for any political party to dismiss it because there's more seniors in the province now than ever before. Yep. And we know those are the people that vote. So, and we know these are the people that are going to need care and they're going to want care and the baby boomers of which are part of this um, booming population mm -hmm. they are a little bit different maybe than their parents were whereas their parents might have been more um, I'll take what I can get I won't ask maybe if I don't <laughs> ask they won't you know um, they certainly um, and I think a part of that it just from that um, generation, it's just, it is very much a generational difference. They grew up during a depressed period where they didn't have much, they didn't ask for much. Yep. Um, they took what they, what they, what they, <laughs> only what they minimally had to. Yep. Whereas this next generation of baby boomers are very different in the sense that they're knowledgeable, they're educated, and in some instances um, have the money to purchase services that they want and need. And so you can't dismiss them. So I think the government would be grossly amiss um, to, to ignore them because, and, and that's really um, is a motivating factor in my work because I do find that people want answers. They're demanding answers and they're gonna demand services too. Mm -hmm. So we better be ready. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is lovely, thank you very much because you're also mapping out that part of the solution has nothing to do with building more buildings. Mm -hmm. It has to do with investing in people. Mm -hmm. and, and nurturing a system of people that deliver the in-home care and the home health care. And it's what they want. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you listen to what people want, uh, the general desire is to be supported at home first. And they're going to be requesting other things too, not just in-home care. They're going to be wanting access to ongoing education. They're going to be wanting mm -hmm. access to technology. They're going to be wanting all kinds of different things that are alive and well in their communities. So this is a this is a knowledgeable generation that's coming up. This this gray wave that's building. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're gonna they're gonna be the real test and we need to be prepared for that. And right now we're very ill prepared to support people at home. In in support of that theme that you just offered on the gray wave, um, past conversations with past guests has to do with the narrative in New Brunswick around aging and aging populations. The guests, of course, were of that age, did not like the conversation and how it's framed very much because they don't want to be typified or characterized as a tsunami sucking up all the resources um, because yeah. their skill sets are, mm -hmm. uh, they're an unusual bunch this time around. Educated. And that they're coming through at a certain age window with a certain life expectancy that's changed, education level that's changed, socioeconomic status that's changed. And now a whole system has to try to catch up with mm. that, that piece. And we're so small that with any luck we can dance 
you know, pick up to the tune and start to dance rather than entrench and say, no, we're going to keep building uh, senior care facilities mm-hmm. instead of mm-hmm. adapting to what the real demand is. Yeah, and I, and I really, um, I don't like those references either, gray waves and the gray tsunami. I'll say it now only for the <laughs> sake of saying it, but I actually look at it um, really more for the opportunity that it does present. This is a, a an educated well experienced um sector yeah. of people that are that are entering retirement and entering into their senior years and we need to engage that yeah. that's what the province could do differently as well is really engage all that knowledge we've got this collective mm-hmm. um there's wonderful educated smart experienced uh, world traveled people in the province. So let's engage them uh, in helping us to solve some of these issues. I'd, I would never uh, dismiss them. Um, oh, you're off to retirement. Good riddance, goodbye. Keep riding the wave. That's not it at all. I, if anything, it's an opportunity to bring them in as part of the solution. Mm-hmm. They're going to be the ones that vote and they're going to be the ones that could very clearly be part of this solution. Mm-hmm. It's almost as if we're living in a window of time where the role of elder in white culture is finally starting to emerge. Mm. If we've started to use that language, that the role of someone with that much life experience, that much skill set, that much wisdom, start to have a voice in the conversation rather than um, how it's been framed to this point in time anyway. I think you're right. That's changed the notion of elder in, in our culture. I think you're right. Focusing back a bit on you a little bit, what's what's the piece of this work that you like the most? Well, I've really narrowed it down. Um, heading into year two um, of uh, owning a new business, and 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 you know you're you're pivoting and trying all kinds <laughs> of different things. Yeah. Um, the thing that it's really boiled down to for me is supporting caregivers. And I realized um, that I do that in a lot of different ways. It could be by providing um, a live talk, like a public education talk, uh, and I've done several of those. It could be by offering a wellness expo, and I hosted one of those back in September, and it was great. Um, And there's uh, one-on-one with families where people really need some very individualized, um, very specific uh, help. Um, in their situation. So even though I do a lot of different things, it really does all boil down to supporting caregivers. And that is why um, the second job, as I refer to it, that activist work that I do in trying to enhance the home support, the personal support worker sector, the two are so closely related. I can't turn my back on a sector that I worked in for 20 years um, because I know the ins and outs of that industry, but I also know how much that um, sector, those those personal support workers, help uh, family caregivers. Really, they work together side by side. And in um, family caregivers rely very heavily on having good, competent, quality personal support workers. And it breaks my heart, honestly, to see them go without care hmm. because they're trying to work they're trying to look after their mom and dad they're trying to maintain doctor's appointments they're trying to upkeep their own health some of them still have kids in high school and university it's this whole sandwich generation there's our next generation that we're going to be talking about (laughs) and they really need support and so the two really go hand in hand but it really does for me it, it i've i've been really laser focused the last year and i realize that it really does all boil down to supporting family caregivers, those that are supporting, caring for an aging loved one. Somewhat related, have there been many changes in technology or science and medicine that you've noticed in the time that helps with the home health care part? Oh, there's all all kinds of stuff. Um, Yeah, as far as like technology, like things that are available for people yeah there's there, there's everything there's there's devices that um i mean the sim- the devices that some people know about like the lifeline buttons that people fall the i've fallen and i can't get up commercial that some people remember um there's there's definitely the lifeline gadgets but um the the medical device um uh, uh, fall detection devices 
they actually can serve other roles too. They can remind people to take their medications. Uh, they have voice prompts that come in that tells you it's time to take your medication. Um, there's even dispensers that will, on a certain time code, dispense the medication. There's nanny cams uh, for people that maybe are hiring in-home services, but they still want to keep it, you know, have a visual of what's happening um, at mom and dad's house. There's all kinds of applications now too. And there, there's been a couple that have been um, in the development phase here locally, actually. Uh, some applications uh, for your phone whereby you can log on and see what's happening with mom or dad so you could be living in another province and log on to your app and if, if it's all connected through each phone then you can you can see different uh, things that are happening with your parents so you mean like literally see well, what? if you had a, one of the cameras, Camera set up? yeah, like some people refer them as nanny cams, okay. um, but where there is an actual monitoring device. So if you're concerned about your loved one roaming or moving around at night or right. getting up um, or maybe having had a fall, then you can visualize it on your phone. Yep. There's all kinds of technology. And on the flip side of the technology is that there's all kinds of technology support now for seniors to learn about how to use it. And I know that you had Sally on your show and yeah. talked about um, DigiLearn and all the great work they're doing. So yeah. it's just ev it's just everywhere. And um, it just adds to some of the supports that can help uh, a caregiver, especially if you're a long distance caregiver. And that's a reality in New Brunswick, hmm. because a lot of the sons and daughters, um, they all got educated and some of them got jobs and moved away. Yep. And so I know some of the caregivers that I've spoken to have been as far away as Switzerland, Japan, New York. Um, they just don't live in New Brunswick anymore, but they are their parents are still here and they still have some connection to the community. And so um, technology like that becomes... Um, well, it's, it's just a win-win for them yeah. because it just gives them an added peace of mind. Yeah. yeah. Thoughts for what you think people should know when they get started with all of this. So mm. um, there, I just did the um thing. <laughs> so when people uh, are looking to first enter the system and they'll catch what they get in the news, which mm. isn't necessarily helpful for them, or for them mm. sometimes, or they'll make their first call to social services or the Department of Health or their family doctor. And then they're trying to muddle through. Is there, mm. you know, it's just a little tidbit or a hint or a tip that you could give them about don't worry, it'll work out or, <laughs> you know, just, yeah, it's, just it's, that first wave because it's, it's like learning a whole new language. All of this is coming at you at a time when you're not completely in crisis, but you're feeling the impending mm edge of a, a crisis if we can't get action in a certain time. Yeah, overwhelm is very real when you're dealing with issues with your loved one. It's obviously very emotionally charged. Mm. It can't not be uh, when it's your loved one. Um, even if your relationship with your parent hasn't always been a good one, um, sometimes that actually makes it more challenging because it becomes more emotionally charged. Um, a word of advice that I would give to people is is not to lose themselves in the whole process. I find that uh, some caregivers can become so intent on resolving every issue that comes at them from a caregiving angle that they really forget about themselves and um, they end up with some compassion fatigue or complete burnout. So in a lot of the work that I do on my social media, it really is to try to um, provide that motivating factor that really is required um, to know that you're not alone, um, that it will get better, um, to focus on what you can change, not what you can't change. Um, just some motivating um, pieces because it can become really draining really fast. So I would, I would encourage people to not lose themselves in the whole process of it. Um, but knowledge is power. And I, that would be the second thing would be about getting educated. Um, but the amount of information that's out there can be overwhelming. And so uh, you have to be really um, selective because your situation is very unique to you and it's very select. Um, there's no shortage of information on senior care, elder care, care for the disabled, community care. It's everywhere. It's coming at us, radio, TV, internet 
it's coming to us from friends, neighbors, every, everyone and everywhere. Um, there's no shortage of information. It's how do I narrow that down into what I need, very specific to what I need. We haven't touched on the financial stuff very much. Um, mm -hmm. Could we explore that a, a little bit? Typical of the pattern, oh, I think I need some help, and how much is it going to cost? So can we wander mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. your perspective and your experience what the financials are like for people needing home health care? Sure. Or for, let's see if I can explain this well. Um, for those that have saved well and are prepared to spend, um, services can be purchased. If we're going to talk about in-home support from a personal support worker, um, you can purchase those services if that's uh, the route that you choose to go. Um, if you need financial subsidy to help pay for that, then you would apply for government subsidy through social development. But yeah, it can get costly. If, if you're looking for in-home supportive help, um, you're probably talking in the range between 20 and $25 per hour. And if your parent needs, I'll, I'll go really small and say three hours of help a day, which is relatively small, um, then you can see how that would add up fairly quickly. And one of the challenges sometimes in working with our seniors is that they don't want to spend. And that goes back to that generational difference that going through the depre uh, depression and saving well and and um, keeping their money uh, not wanting to spend it and so um, they may not want to purchase the care so they'll sometimes go without and then on the other side with social development they may not want to divulge any of their financial information in order to go through the financial assessment process so <laughs> there can be some challenges in that area um, when you're working with your loved one because of may maybe one of those situations. But it can get costly. And the most that would ever be subsidized by the province in New Brunswick is about eight or nine hours a day. So if you require more than that, then you would have to look at the next um, step, which would probably be like a supervised care facility, like a special care home. So unless you can um, finance all of your home care yourself, and there are some people that are in that unique situation, um, then the most you'll ever be subsidized by the province is up to eight or nine hours. Sometimes they'll, if they feel it's to the benefit, they'll look at each case individually, but I doubt you would ever rarely see more than nine hours a day approved. So if you need more than that, then you have to look at a different option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it does get expensive. Hmm. Yeah. In your experience, have you found um, people have been able to get through the process and get results? Again, media tend to report it in the negative. Uh, all, I always <laughs> all the frustrations and this isn't working, and yeah. but we never hear the stories of where it did kick in, mm -hmm. where the services were great, um, mm -hmm. the expenses were covered. I always used to say, and I still say it today. I just said it last week. Um, when it works, it works. When you have that great combination of um, well-trained, well-qualified staff working with clients who whose care needs they're able to manage and care for, when the family's contributing, when the care workers are working closely together, um, it can flow and it can flow really well and it can work really well. I've seen many clients, many family situations where they've been supported at home and it's just worked. Those people have stayed out of the hospital. They've been taking their medications. They're as healthy and well as they can be in their community, still involved in their community, still out um, uh, doing things that they would like to be able to do. And I, I do believe that a lot of that is the supportive care that they're getting. So when it works, it works, and it can work really well. Keep mm. people out of the hospital and keep people from falling. Yeah. Key. Key. Do you have a sense of the scale or the numbers of what that would be? Again, mainstream media will talk about the drainage of resources mm. in a hospital with people who are there that shouldn't be there because they should be cared for at home. But yeah. we never get a sense of the numbers. Is it 8,000? Is it 10,000? Is it 4% of the population? Is it 15% of the population? Mm. And 
because an election's coming, we'll be talking about health care costs. It'll be the number one um, cost for the government. Oh, we have to reduce, that, that we have to find efficiencies. And you've mapped out <laughs> where one of those solutions are about keeping people in home, put the money over here for professionals to be trained to come into the home, and that would save you over there. <clears throat> but do we have a sense of scale? Is it 5,000 that we need, 10,000 people that we're talking about? Yeah, I, I'd, I would, I'd be guesstimating to say, um, like two or three thousand. So there, the, when we talked earlier about the huge potential for a job creation opportunity, mm -hmm. um, and these are people that can be, there's existing courses in the province. Mm -hmm. um, there's one um, educational organization, and the estimate they gave was about $3,500. So we spend lots more than that on call center employees for call centers who don't even stay in New Brunswick. Uh, so I, I'd like to, to look at how can we try to uh, subsidize people to get their education at a more costly rate for people that are gonna stay here and look after our own people. Yeah. So I think at any given time, there's probably between three and 400 people who are in an acute care hospital bed waiting for either placement in a nursing home, special care home, or to go back home. A lot of those people don't go back home. Mm -hmm. um, the doctors really don't f have any faith in the home care sector. And I can't say I blame them. They are ultimately responsible for their patients and they have to feel confident that they're going home to a safe situation where mm -hmm. they're going to be well cared for and well supervised. And if their health needs demand supervision with their medications, with bathing, dressing, grooming, walking, mobility, mm -hmm. um, and the doctors don't feel that the home support, the personal support sector can, can do that, then they'll say you have to go to a nursing home. Yeah. They won't encourage it, and I don't blame them. So there's a there there's a lot, again, it goes back to that uh, snow globe. There's a lot of restructuring that has to happen. A big part of it's education and getting more people uh, wanting to be, uh, we need to build a care force. Yeah. That's what I call it, hashtag care force. Care force. Hashtag NB care force. We need to build a care force to care for our own people. And yeah, create jobs for a lot of people. What can be a hugely rewarding for those situations where I said people were being uh, maintained at home, uh, their risk of falls were lowered, they were eating good meals, yeah. they were being socialized, they weren't um, isolated, they were engaged in their community, their families were well supported. In those situations, for those caregivers, that's a very rewarding career. Yeah. And if we could just get the wages up to where the pay equity suggests that it should have been in 2012, mm -hmm. they suggest that personal care workers in the province should have been paid $20 an hour in 2012. And now we're 2018. Yeah. If we could just make some of those things happen, then I think we could have a lot more people being supported at home. This is wonderful. You're mapping out where solutions are, how to get mm -hmm. to the solutions. Um, and helping to shift the narrative away from the chronic problem description that media tend to drive about healthcare costs in New Brunswick mm. and bed blockers and mm. tsunamis of seniors and that narrative needs Nobody to go away. Nobody ever wanted to be a bed blocker. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's it's like no, this is worst case scenario stuff. So don't make it yeah. the headline. You know, yeah. it's not the headline. Yeah. Um, we have maybe five minutes left. Where would you like to wander to wrap us mm. up? Is there something we haven't touched on? We've touched on a bit of politics, a bit of the economics, um, a bit of uh, the demographics and the, the scale, your personal yeah. story to a degree, impact on a home for a family and its soul, you know? Yeah, I just I just think it, it's so timely um, what it is that we're talking about today and even the work that I'm developing. It's, it's just all so timely. I was thinking about that as I was coming over here, how... Um, the work that I'm doing to support caregivers because more than ever caregivers family caregivers are being called upon um, and it, it really doesn't stop whether their their parent or their loved one is at home whether they're in a special care home or whether they're in the hospital or whether they're in a nursing home you, you, you really never stop 
um, being a caregiver. But um, I really realized that more than ever, we're relying on family caregivers um, to support their loved ones because mm -hmm. having people at home that's who that's who they're relying on it's not just personal care workers it's not just extramural it's this whole team of people that come together it's the doctor it's the visiting nurses it's the pharmacist it could be the personal care worker it could be a dietitian that's visiting there's a whole um, uh, bunch <laughs> of people that support and in the middle of course is the the person requiring support and care and their family is right along with them so the that's why I find my work is just so exciting and it's so necessary because more than ever caregivers need to be supported because they are right there on the front line with their family member doing everything they can to advocate um, and do the best thing for them because families in the end want the best thing for their loved one really and so i just really consider it an honor that that i am a part of that so um that's why i think over the course of the last year um that i've really just as i said before laser focused on supporting those caregivers in whatever it might be it might just be they need a little advice maybe they need a lot of advice maybe they need a whole plan um, maybe it's helpful for them just to see a motivational post. Today is Motivation Monday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe a caregiving tip that comes up. Maybe that really lands for them and they thought, I never thought about that. Hmm. Um, maybe coming to a live event where they can um, hear that there's other people that are going through something similar, that it's not just me, like a, like a lot of people are experiencing this. And having that mutual support, what I call a circle of care, where we all support each other hmm. so it's 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 hugely exciting i love it yeah thank you so much for thank this you. it's been Thanks, an amazing wonderful conversation anytime <laughs> and thank you for watching be good have fun love each other the dennis report is an independent media production to support the program go to dennisatchison.com and click become my patron on patreon mm -hmm.